Well, good morning, good morning. Very happy to be back with you. Uh, welcome to those of you worshiping in the chapel and uh, participating online. This is the second Sunday uh, in a, a two-Sunday set on the Christian family. Last week, uh, I had the opportunity to come and talk about a Christian vision for parenting and grandparenting. We talked about visionary parenting. This morning, we're going to talk about a Christian vision for marriage. Now, this message is going to be relevant for everybody, whether you are married, whether you are single, whether you used to be married. Matter of fact, let me ask you this question. How many of you know someone who's married? If you raised your hand, then this message is for you. Uh, I've got my work cut out for me a little bit because the, the Visionary Marriage Conference that Amy and I do is a five-hour teaching conference. And so Pastor Troy, a couple months ago, and we're talking about this weekend, he said, hey, why don't you hack that down to 45 minutes or so and give it a shot on Sunday. So I, I'm going to talk fast, and you're going to listen fast because we're going to pack a whole lot in. Now, I wish my wife was here this morning, my wife Amy. We've been married 21 years together, and if it's okay, I would like to tell you the true story of how Amy and I met and fell in love. Can I do that? Okay. August 28th, 1993, which is now known as First Eyes Day, our eyes met across a crowded room at the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College. And I did what any red-blooded American man would do, run. Because I see this real pretty girl over there, and the last thing in the world I'm going to do is go over and say, hi, my name is Rob, I'd like to buy you a cup of coffee. Because if I ask a girl like that out, what's she going to say? No, that's right. And we don't need that kind of rejection in our life, do we? So, <laughs> I am just going to admire from afar. Now, over the course of the next couple months, the, the story here is about to take a dark turn particularly in the eyes of you ladies. So be prepared. I am a person of very low moral fiber, as you will see. Over the course of these next couple months, I go on a couple dates with another young lady. Amy was working as a waitress at a Mexican restaurant in town. And on one of these dates with this other young lady, I suggest to her, hey, how about we go to the Mexican restaurant? <laughs> in secret hopes of seeing Amy. Now look, I'm like, what's the big deal? This is not a problem. She doesn't even know I exist. So what difference does it make? Well, it turns out she did know I exist. She liked me. She thought I liked her because I was staring at her all the time. So she thought I was bringing the other girl there to snub her. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm here for you. I mean, this is... Some of you women are like, oh, we're not listening to him. He's terrible. Yes. I am terrible. Um, it didn't go well. It, things, the whole thing blows up in my face. The, it then reverted back. I don't know if you remember like relationships in junior high school. Some of you are junior high students right now. It, it took a mutual friend, Rob, his name is Rob, to come to me and say, hey, Rob, you know, I think Amy likes you. Really? You think she likes me? Yeah. And if you ask her out, she'll say yes. I'm 23 years old. Now, once, once all fear of failure is removed, yeah, I'm asking her out. <laughs> That's good. So I ask her out, we date for five months, we get engaged, we're engaged for five months and we're married. Here we are, 21 years later, seven children, four boys, three girls, our oldest is 18, our littlest is one. Amazing. Now, what I'm going to share with you this morning, very personal for me, because this Christian vision of marriage that, that I want to share with you is not the kind of marriage Amy and I had for the first 13 years we were together. I was a Christian before we were married, she was a Christian before we were married. And we figured, well, that's all it takes. You get two Christians, you get a Christian marriage. Not for us. We didn't understand God's purpose for marriage. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. God's purpose for marriage. He's the one who invented it. He's the one who thought it up. Now, God made marriage to reflect His glory. God made marriage as a picture of, of His love between Christ and the church. But what we're going to talk about today is, is the purpose of marriage, the function of marriage. Why in the world did God create this thing? And if you lock yourself in a room with the Bible and you ask God that question, God, what, what are the purposes of marriage? Two overarching purposes come through. The first one is the mission of spiritual transformation. God made marriage to spiritually transform each other. 
The second purpose of marriage is the mission of raising godly children. God wants to fill the earth with his people. So he made male and female and marriage and babies and expanding through the generations. Last week, we talked more about that visionary parenting, visionary grandparenting calling. So this morning, we're going to zero in on the first mission of marriage, which is the spiritual transformation of one another. Now, how many of you are here, and you probably uh, perhaps heard one of the most common marriage myths that's out there, that you shouldn't try to change your spouse? Raise your hand if you ever heard that. You should not try to change your spouse. Okay. Well, unless you married Jesus, your spouse needs changing. Raise your hand if your spouse needs some changing. Put your hand down. What do you do? Uh, oh, ra- raise your hand if you need some changing. Oh, there we go. Oh, yes, Pastor Rob, I need changing. I can't believe he raised his hand. Uh, now, if you're a married man, God thinks you need changing. He wants to change you into the image of his son. So God decided if you're a married man, there's one woman out of the three and a half billion women in the world that would be the perfect one to bring into your life to change you, to help you become more like Christ. And if you're a married woman, God says, you need changing. You need to be changed and conformed into the image of my son. I've got a man, one man out of the three and a half billion men in the world. He's the perfect one to change you, to love you and serve you and lead you toward becoming more like Christ. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about the role of the husband in changing his wife and spiritually transforming his wife. How does he encourage her spiritually? And then we're going to talk about the role of the wife to spiritually bless and encourage her husband, this mission of spiritual transformation. Now, by way of one more preamble here, I believe the Bible teaches, this is all the way back in the beginning of Genesis, goes all the way through, that God made men and women with equal value, equal worth, equal dignity, equal importance, right out of the gates. The Bible also teaches we're equally sinful. We, We equally bring disaster everywhere we go. The Bible also says it created us differently. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. I've got a couple pictures that maybe illustrate differences between men and women. Here's the first one. I don't know if you can see that up on the screen or not. <clears throat> the man is pretty much two basic modes of operation. There is the on mode and the, the blessed off mode. Amen, men? The woman's settings are more, help me. Yes, complex, delicate, perhaps we might say, a more mysterious. All right, here's another picture. The mission is to go to Gap and buy a pair of pants. <laughs> Six minutes, $33 later, mission accomplished. And uh, she never even goes to Gap. <laughs> God made us different because he's got different roles for us. And when I say roles, I'm not talking about who mows the lawn and does the dishes. You'll see in just a minute. Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 is the the keynote chapter in Scripture on marriage. Many other passages where God speaks to marriage, but I think Ephesians 5 is the the centerpiece. And what we're going to find here is the role and purpose of the husband, uh, as well as the role and purpose of the wife. So look with me now in Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to look at the role of the husband first, verses 25 and 26. It says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. In your worship folder, you've got a little outline for the message, and you're going to find three job descriptions for the husband and three job descriptions for the wife. So, men, what's the first item on the job description from God? Husbands what? Love your wives. So, write that one in that first blank. Husbands love. One of the things you can do when you read your Bible is to ask questions of God as you read. All right, God, love my wife. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to love her? God says, I'm so glad you asked. I've got another chapter of the Bible where I tell you what it means to love somebody. Bible scholars, what chapter is that? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. All right, so let's go over there and see what it means for a husband to love his wife. You go there, 1 Corinthians 13, 4. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking. 
It's not easily angered, and it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. So I've got this little three-by-five card at home. And on my little three-by-five card, it says, when it comes to Amy, I'm patient. When it comes to Amy, I'm kind. When it comes to Amy, I don't envy. I don't boast around her. I'm not proud with her. I'm not rude to her. I don't seek what I want. I don't get angry easily with her. I don't keep a record of the wrong things she's done. I don't delight when evil things happen to her. I rejoice when good things happen to her. I always protect her. I always trust. I always hope. And in my little card, and I never tire of doing any of these things. That's I always persevere. Now, is that a true and accurate statement of how I love Amy every day? Who said that? What? Put your hand up. What's your name, sir? Mike. Strike one for you. Mike just said no. Well, Mike... Despite your harshness with me, you're right. No, that is not a true and accurate statement of how I love my wife every day. But can we agree this is God's holy and righteous command for me? Husbands, love your wives. Okay, Lord, what's that? Well, it's all that stuff. Have you ever read your Bible and felt, you see, the holy and righteous command of God, the holy and righteous command of God? You ever feel like God is setting a high jump bar 100 feet off the ground and commanding you to jump over it? Now, there's two things you can do with all these holy and righteous commands. One is the popular thing. The other is the purpose of those holy and righteous commands. The popular thing is to look up at the 100-foot high jump bar and say, man, I don't think that's really what God meant to say. I mean, I I can't do that. You know what I mean? So I think what he really meant, you know, if the Bible was written today, husbands, you know, be decent guy, provide, don't mess things up too bad, God. Just three or four feet, you know, off the ground, and I'll, I'll flop over. The other thing you can do, and this is the purpose of the law, the New Testament says, is that you look up at the holy and righteous command of God, this command for husbands to love their wives, and you look up at that 100-foot high jump bar, and you say, God, I don't have it in me. I don't have it in me. I don't have the faith or character or virtue to love this woman. But I know someone who can jump over that bar. And that's my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live. The life I live in this body, I actually live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So Jesus, here's my plan to be a husband today. You've got to love her. I'm going to hide in you. Your Holy Spirit, if your Holy Spirit does not enable me and supernaturally empower me to live like Christ today, I've got no chance of being the husband that you call me to be. Number one, men, love. Number two, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Second mission, men, is serve. Second mission, men, is serve. Love and serve. Now, when we talk about serving our wives, we are not talking about this guy in the picture. (laughs) Now, the picture... It's just a snapshot in time. It's possible. Maybe he's been carrying the sticks for 20 miles. He now needs the nutrient of the cigarette to continue. (laughs) We don't know. It just doesn't, does not look good. All right, let me show you another picture. This one's a video. Now, this is going to be a man named Robertson McQuilkin. Robertson McQuilkin was the president of Columbia Bible College for many years. His wife became sick uh, with Alzheimer's. And this is a portion of his retirement speech to the students. Take a look at this. I haven't in my life experienced easy decision making on major decisions, but uh, one of the simplest and clearest decisions I've had to make is this one, because circumstances dictated it. Uh, Muriel, now, uh, in the last couple of months, seems to be almost happy when with me and almost never happy when not with me. In fact, she seems to feel trapped, becomes very fearful, sometimes almost terror. And when she can't get to me, there can be anger. She's in distress. But when I'm with her, she's happy and contented. 
and so I must be with her at all times. And you see, it's not only that I promise in sickness and in health till death do us part, and I'm a man of my word. But as I have said, I don't know with this group, but I've said publicly, it's the only fair thing she sacrificed for me for four years to make my life possible. So, if I cared for her for 40 years, I'd still be in debt. However, there's much more. It's not that I have to, it's that I get to. I love her very dearly, and you can tell it's not easy to talk about. She's a delight. It's a great honor to care for such a wonderful person. Tell me the words you'd use to describe this guy, this man. Loyal, sweet, humble, sacrificial, compassionate. You know, one of them for me is manly, masculine. That's a man's man right there. Serving his wife in her time of need. So men first love, second serve. Now at the beginning of verse 26, you get the ultimate purpose of being a husband in the marriage relationship. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church who gave himself up for her. And what's the beginning of verse 26 say? To make her holy. Do you remember what the first mission of marriage was? Spiritual transformation of one another. What's the ultimate purpose of the husband? To sanctify his wife, to love her, serve her. And now the third one, men, lead her toward becoming more like Christ. Love, serve, and lead. Now, when I think about this part of God's call for me to be a spiritual leader in my marriage relationship with Amy, I feel so inadequate and I feel so insecure. Because in so many ways, Amy is a more spiritually mature person than me. She's a more godly person than me. She's further down the path of faith than me in so many areas. So how in the world am I supposed to be the spiritual leader for someone who's out in front? Two options. One, God didn't really mean that. Totally fine for her to be out in front. You just go along for the ride, which is what I did for the first 13 years of our marriage. Or... God, I feel so inadequate. I feel so insecure. I don't know how to be a spiritual leader in my marriage, but you do. And I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live the life I live in the body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God, help me. 2007, Amy and I had been married 13 years. And the Lord worked a real miracle in our marriage and and turned my heart for the first time to the ministry of my wife. Well, I was serious about ministry to everybody else, helping everybody else grow in their faith, but the idea that God called me to help my wife grow in her faith hardly ever dawned on me. God brought me to a real place of brokenness and repentance and and turned my heart toward her. I remember a time shortly after that, someone came up to me and said, hey, Rob, how's ministry going? I said, well, uh, here's how I'm trying to encourage Amy, and so I'm trying to pray with her. They're like, no, 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 what's going on at church? I said, oh, Sorry. The person said ministry, and for the first time in my life, my first thought was my wife. Men, let me ask you, if someone came up to you and said, hey, how's ministry going? Whatever your ministry might be at the bank, at the school, at the sports team, at the church, would your first thought, if you're a married man, would your first thought be your ministry to the soul of your wife? Now, let's talk practically. Well, how in the world, Rob, how in the world am I supposed to be a spiritual leader in the relationship? Well, look at the end of verse 26. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. There's the mission. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the Word. Cleansing her by the washing with water through the Word. Now, this washing with water thing is an illustration and a picture which we could spend a lot of time talking about. But the simple piece is this, that the husband brings the Word of God into the marriage relationship so that the husband and the wife can grow together in faith. Making it real simple, the husband reads the Bible with his wife. Now, let me ask you a few questions. Uh, survey questions for you guys. Men, how many of you would say you think it's important for husbands and wives to read the Bible together? 
Good. How many of you guys would say, uh, God wants you to read the Bible together? You have to raise your hand for that one because it's in, on the screen. It's on the verse. Uh, number three, how many of you would say reading the Bible together is easy to do? All right, I need to help you with that. There are, you're like, no, it's not easy to do. There, there's, there's two things required. Uh, one, you have to be able to read. Even if, you know, actually, even if you can't read, some of these Bibles have a, a, on your smartphone, you listen to it, just push play, and you can do that. And you also have to have 60 seconds, maybe five minutes. You could read a, a psalm, a parable, a proverb. That'd be two lines. So you have to be able to read, and you have to have a minute, maybe five. That's all that's required. So now let me ask you a question. How many of you would say reading the Bible together is easy to do? Good. You did better that time. Now, how many of you would say you struggle reading the Bible with your wife? Wow. All right, let's review. How many of you said reading the Bible is important? Oh, yes, Pastor Rob, very important. How many of you say God wants you to do it? Yep, God wants me to do it. How many of you would say it's easy to do with help? You're like, yeah, I just read a little something. It's easy to do. And then how many of you struggle doing that? Yeah, I really struggle doing that. We hardly ever do that. Does that make any sense? The reason why it doesn't make any sense, you forgot something in the equation. You missed a critical ingredient. This is something important. This is something God wants you to do. It's real easy. It doesn't take a whole lot of time. Satan and the demons are going to throw everything at you to prevent you from doing this because they simply cannot afford to have you open the book together. They can't. Because if you do, you know what you're going to get? You're going to get more faith because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The Word of God's living and active, sharpening a double-edged sword. It's going to change your hearts. It's going to renew your minds. It's going to supernaturally empower you through the Holy Spirit to live for Christ in your marriage. They've got to keep you as far away from the book as possible. So here's the way it goes, guys. Even this afternoon, you go home, you go, Ah, honey, I was wondering if we could, like, read the Bible or something. (laughs) Who are you? What have you done with my husband? Okay. (laughs) And you sit down, read a parable, a psalm, a proverb, okay? When you're done reading, just say, "Uh, thanks for listening. (laughs) Yeah, thanks for reading. And get up and go about your business. You're like, is it really going to be that awkward? Yes. Yes, a thousand times yes, because of the spiritual attack coming against you in the relationship. Same thing with prayer. Okay, this passage specifically talks about the husband and wife opening the word together for spiritual food and strength. But same thing with prayer. How many of you men would say praying together with your wife is important to do? Yeah. How many of you think God wants you to pray together? Yes, God wants me to do it. How many of you would say praying with your wife's easy? Dear Lord, thank you for our family. Bless our marriage. Help us. Amen. You just prayed with your wife. Now, I mean, not the best prayer ever, but that's fine. You prayed with your wife. It takes three seconds, five seconds, one minute. And then raise your hand if you struggle praying together as husband and wife. Yeah, we really struggle with that. Well, what are you missing? It's important. God wants you to do it. It doesn't take a lot of time. It's easy to do. Satan and the demons are going to throw everything at you to prevent you from doing this. First 13 years of our marriage, Amy and I hardly ever prayed together. Of course, I was a pastor at church and uh, very spiritual. And I mean, I'm in prayer meetings all day. It's just what I do. So by the time I get home, I mean, I'm prayed out. Prayed out can't be expected to pray with her. So when God turned my heart to my wife in 2007, first thing we started doing was praying together every night before bed. So we've got about eight years now of, of prayer together every night. Uh, so that's 13 years without prayer, eight years with prayer. I got five more to go before I'm, I'm even, before I'm dug out of 13 prayerless years. But I can't tell you the number of times, and this is something that Amy doesn't completely understand because she's not a boy. I'll talk about this more in a minute. So many times I lay in bed, and this is 2,800 nights of prayer now, Lay in bed, the Holy Spirit prompts me, Rob, time to pray with Amy. Oh, and I got this pit of anxiety in my stomach. I don't know. I don't know if I feel like it. I don't know if she feels like it. Maybe I'll just take the cover and just... Where's that coming from? It's spiritual attack, spiritual attack, spiritual attack. I can't tell you the number of times. See, sometimes the last thing in the world we want to do is pray together. Because we're angry. Or we're hurt or we're bitter or we're sad or we're lonely. We've had a difficult day. And one person says, hey, can we pray? Fine. <laughs> Last thing in the world you want to do. You take hands, a cold dead fish. <laughs> God, help us. And I can't tell you the number of times 
just with two words, help us. The Holy Spirit swoops in, softens my heart toward her, softens her heart toward me, gives us supernatural strength to deal with the thing that's been dividing us that day. Lots more that we can say here, but ladies, let's, uh, let's capture a biblical vision for the mission God has for you. Because, you know, at this point, a lot of the wives are like, well, I think you, time to pray and wrap up. I mean, we got what we came for. <laughs> you know, this, this is it. I hope it's good. You know, in a lot of churches, uh, you can still do pretty plain talk for husbands, but uh, doing plain talk for wives is a little more off limits. Um, not today. So let's, uh, let me put up three scriptures that speak to the role and mission of the wife. It starts in Genesis chapter 2, 18. God's made Adam, Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a what? Help or suitable for him. Ladies, you're taking notes now, right, on your three missions, your three callings. Number one is help. Now we're back in Ephesians chapter 5. We'll go through each of these. Back in Ephesians chapter 5, you find the S word in verse 22. Wives, what? All right, you said it. I didn't. Submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Then in Ephesians 5.33, the beginning of that verse says, however, each husband must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. The wife must respect her husband. So ladies, God's given you three missions. Husband's got love, serve, lead. You've got help, submit, and respect. Now the culture accuses Christians of teaching male dominance and woman subservience. That's what they tell us we teach. Were you here for the last 20 minutes? Do you remember what God says to husbands? Love your wives, be patient, be kind, be gentle, serve her, lay down your life for her. I mean, what kind of a sick picture of manhood does the Bible teach? You know, the Bible doesn't, anytime there's abuse of violence, adultery, addiction, I mean, God condemns those sins in the strongest possible terms. And I should say, friends, if you find yourself in an emergency room crisis marriage situation, let me plead with you after the service. Maybe you're here by yourself or maybe you're here with that spouse in that emergency crisis with one of those very serious things. Let me plead with you. Today may be the day that God starts a miracle of deliverance and healing in your marriage. After the service, you go right over to this prayer room. You walk in there and you say, we are in the emergency room. We need help. And you take whatever's been in the darkness and you drag it out and you put it out in the light. And you turn yourself and you trust yourself to the mercy of God. Today may be that day. Okay, I'd like to start uh, at the bottom, if that's okay. We're going to start with respect. Wives, respect your husbands. Now, you probably know that the New Testament was written in, in Greek. And so when you want to really study a passage in depth, you can go to the Greek word and find out the original meaning of the Greek word to kind of plumb the depths of the riches of the Word of God. So you go to the original word that Paul used here for wives, respect your husbands. And what you find is that the original word actually meant respect. <laughs> yeah. So everything you think the word means is exactly what you think the word means. So a respect for a friend, respect for a coworker, respect for a boss, your attitude, your, your tone of voice, the way you approach that person. Ladies, let me just give you a couple of uh, uh, practical things to encourage you with this. Now, it is very possible for a husband to be disrespectful to a wife, just like a wife can be disrespectful to a husband. But one of the things, ladies, I'd encourage you to be on the lookout for is something called indirect communication. Indirect communication. So you're running late for church. Not that that would happen. You're running late for church, and you say to your husband, the lights are on upstairs. And he says, yes, they are. We're late. Let's go. Now, when you say the lights are on upstairs, you're not just kind of making a statement of fact, right? You're saying, what you're really saying is, dear sweet husband, would you please take a moment, run upstairs, and turn off the lights before we leave? But you're not communicating directly, you're communicating indirectly. Or, comes down for work in the morning, are you wearing that today? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> That's really not what you mean. What you mean is, dear sweet husband, can I help you, right? <laughs> Can I use my gifts in this area and put you together a little differently? Ladies, let me also warn you about something. And I never, this one never dawned on me until I saw it live and in, in full color. Be careful how you talk about your husband when he's not around. 
I was in a hotel lobby in San Antonio. I'm down there getting my coffee man behind the desk. This older couple comes in. They they check out of their room. They go back in the elevator. They disappear. A few moments later, the woman comes back in and and hustling, bustling over the desk. Husbands are such idiots. My husband is an absolute idiot. Guy at the desk looks over at me. Help me. I'm like, no way, pal. I'm just getting coffee. And, uh, you know, the, the husband had left something in the room and she needed the key. She needed to go back up to the room to get it. And I was thinking, I'm like, wow, I wonder if she talks like this when he's around. This woman probably did. But the, the, the thought I had was how toxic for her own heart to say these things. He's not around, right? She's self-poisoning with these words. You know, the other piece of this, ladies, is I caution you even how you think about your husband. If only he was this, if only he was that, if only he was this. And you know what? All of those things may be true. Those desires of your heart, those things that he needs help with may be true. But you know what you're doing? You're self-poisoning. You're self-poisoning. Now, in our counseling ministry, we uh, talk to a lot of uh, women who will say, well, Rob, uh, I get this whole respect thing, but respect must be earned. When my husband starts acting respectably, then I will start respecting him. And I get that. I also get that, that a woman that talks like that has probably been really hurt, probably for a very long period of time. So that's my sort of lens that I, I take that through. But let's play that out. Let's go back to the man's role. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. The pivot for the husband's love is Christ's love. Do we as the church, do we deserve the unconditional love of Christ? Have we earned it with our noble character and perfect behavior? No, yet Christ what? loves us, still loves us. So ladies, tough question now, answer truthfully, not the way the world would tell you. Do you deserve the love of your husband? Have you earned it with your noble character and perfect behavior? Hello? (laughs) No. You're like, no, no. But what does God command your husband to do? Love you. Now men, do you deserve the respect of your wives? Have you earned it? with your noble character and perfect behavior? No. But yet, ladies, what does God command you to do? Respect Him. You see, nobody comes out good. We all need Jesus. It's like the whole point of the Bible. You get it? (laughs) And this whole respect thing, let's play it out the other way. What if your husband comes to you and says, you know what? God tells me to love you, and as soon as you're lovable, I'll love you. (laughs) Well, I won't have that. No, I won't. And you'd be right not to have it, okay? So the husband loves even though she doesn't deserve it. The wife respects even though he doesn't deserve it. All right, let's talk about this second mission, the mission of helper. Lord God said, or the first one on your outline there, the Lord God said, Genesis 2.18, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, on this one at first, um, some people look at this and they, they kind of say, well, that does sound a little degrading. I mean, you get to be a helper, Yay! So good for you. You know, you help. Um, There's another another being in the Bible that gets the title helper. Anybody know who that is? Yeah, the Holy Spirit's called the helper. In fact, same Hebrew word. Does anyone want to make the case that the Holy Spirit is, is secondary, insignificant, not that important, no big deal? I don't want to make that case. Now, ladies, just because you get the same Hebrew descriptor word doesn't mean you are the Holy Spirit. Uh... It gets muddied up sometimes, uh, I've, I, I've seen. Okay, well, Rob, all right, I'm supposed to be the helper. Well, help with what? Help with what? Ladies, help with the most important mission of your marriage, which is help him become a more godly man. Help him become a more godly man. And listen, if you're feeling discouraged in that, well, I'm trying to help him. I'm trying. God thinks that you're the perfect woman to do it. He picked you for it. You have to remind yourself of that. When you're feeling discouraged in your desire to help your husband grow, God thought you were the perfect one. One of the critical ingredients, ladies, if you want to embrace this mission, I do want to help him become a more godly man. You have to start to understand the unique and powerful spiritual attack that your husband is under. I want you to imagine your your family is like a, a, a group of bike riders, okay? And your husband's the lead rider. And the wife is drafting behind the husband, and then kids and grandkids behind them. And uh, you're going through the, 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 the hills of life, uh, surrounded by, by Satan and the demons and the temptations of the world. And Satan and the demons want that whole family to crash and burn. That is their objective. 
And so they are going to fire their fiery darts of temptation against that family and spiritual battle against that family. They want the whole family to crash and burn. So who's going to get the majority of the arrows? Lead rider. Lead rider. Now, everybody's getting their own special attack. Don't get me wrong. But there's a special attack on lead rider because if lead rider would crash and burn, maybe we could get a chain reaction and everybody would crash and burn. So here's the way it works in a lot of Christian families. The husband's the lead rider. He's pedaling away. Doop, 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 doop. Arrows all over the place. Wife drafting behind him saying, you know, I think we could pick up the pace a little bit. <laughs> and she's right. But what she doesn't understand, and I'm gonna, I don't want to overstate it, but in almost every situation, the number one reason why your husband may be struggling in spiritual leadership is because of the spiritual attack coming against him that you don't understand. And so women, what I want that to do for you is to say, oh, really? I want your heart to be filled with compassion for him. I said, well, I want to help him. Let me tell you a true story. This is a sad one. We had a couple in our, our ministry, and this, this guy, when it came to like I don't know, being public with his faith or praying or doing any kind of this Bible reading stuff we talked about. This is no way Jose. So he, uh, he picks Thanksgiving dinner as the first time he's going to try praying out loud. Okay. So he's got 18, 20 family members there, whatever. And he says, uh, <clears throat> I thought we could pray before we eat. And everybody's like, wow, okay, this is new. So they hold hands. And he's, okay, God, uh, giving thanks, uh, Jesus, Turkey, thankful, muchly, uh, very thankful, amen. Squeeze, done. Okay. Now, this guy is just not good at this, and he's terrified. He's never, never done this before. An hour later, wife meets him. It's a true story. Meets him in a private room of the house. He says, what was that? I have no idea what you said. And it was really short. Now, let's back up the tape. What, what this guy just did, the, the fact of the situation, is that he took the family flag, climbed Mount Everest, and crammed it down. He prayed at Thanksgiving dinner. That's what he did. His wife comes to him an hour later and says, that stunk. Imagine, that's the true story, Imagine the response had been different. Imagine an hour later, his wife comes to him in a private part of the house, puts her arms around him, looks him in the eye and says, you are such a good man. I'm so proud of you. Do you know what you just did? You just prayed at Thanksgiving dinner. I have no idea what it must have taken for you to do what you just did. I am so proud of you. I love you. I'm going to prove I love you when these people get out of our house. You know what you're going to get, ladies, on something like that? Yep. Yeah, it's spiritual leadership right there, baby. <laughs> Got more of that where that came from. <laughs> Men, do you think that if your wife did the second response, you might try praying again? Yeah. My wife liked it. My wife was proud of me. Ladies, because you're not a boy, no offense, because you're not a boy, you don't know how powerful your words of affirmation and blessing are. Amen. And I want to just, I want to, I want to warn you about something. That was a silly picture before the on-off switch and all the other things. But I, I'm convinced that, that there's, there's something in a man's spirit. If he becomes convinced that he cannot please his wife, I can't please her. I can't make her happy. There's something in there. Ladies, you don't ever want that switch to go off because you are in real trouble now at something very deep in your marriage relationship. I had a woman come to me after a conference recently. She said, well, Rob, okay, I want to, you know, affirm him and cheerlead for him, but he doesn't do any of the stuff you talked about. He never prays. He didn't even pray bad at Thanksgiving. He never prays. He doesn't read the Bible, doesn't do any of these things. I said, well, does he go to church? Oh, yeah. Oh, he goes to church. Oh, we sit together down there and then he, he, he goes to church. I'm like, well, when was the last time you thanked him for being a church man? and setting such a good example for your kids. She's like, i got to thank him for going to church? I'm like, all right, well, do you have girlfriends whose husbands don't go to church? She's like, oh, yeah, i got a bunch of girlfriends. Their husband never darkened the door of a church. 
Well, are you grateful for a church man? See, ladies, every one of you, you're married to a mixed bag, right? He's got some positive virtues and some negative virtues. I'm not saying you don't address the negative things, but with those little positive things, these little sprouts, you're doing good, honey. I love you. I'm so proud of you. Bless him. Bless him. Encourage him. You'll be shocked at the results. Well, let me talk with you about this These final two words, I want to talk a little bit more about helping and and submitting. Part of the challenge that Christian women are in is that both of these roles, to help her husband and to submit to her husband, these roles uh, are are relative roles. They're empty words. If I just say, hey, come on over and help me, it doesn't mean anything. I need to tell you what, help, help me move this wood. Help me take care of my kids. See, help me, empty. Got to fill it with something. Help me with what? Same with submit. Someone comes up to you and says, I want you to submit. What are you talking about? What am I submitting to? And so, real literally in English, this word submission means to be under the mission of someone else. So, someone's got a mission and you're in submission. In other words, submitting and helping. Help with what? Submit to what? These two roles for the wife hinge on and are defined by the husband's compelling mission for his life. Why is he here? What is he doing? What is his mission and purpose? Now there's something to help with and be in submission to. Here's what had to happen in my relationship with Amy. I wish it happened when we were engaged. It was 13 years into marriage as Christians without a Christian marriage. Finally, the the way God worked in my heart and worked in her heart, finally I went to Amy and I'm like, honey, let let me tell you why I think God made me. I, I I think God made me to glorify Him. And the number one mission that He's given me is to love and serve and lead you. And I think God's brought us together in marriage for the mission of raising our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren for the glory of God. And we're going to serve our churches and be a light for Christ. That's why I think I'm here. Now, Amy, let me ask you a question. Will you help me succeed? And the heart of the Christian woman says what? Yeah, your mission is to love me. Sign me up for that. I submit. <laughs> you, what you end up with is what Genesis talks about. A man will leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two will become one. You see, folks, here's what we've got. Christian marriages all over the place. They've left father and mother. They've cleaved to one another. They've got a new life, but they've never become one in their mission in life. It's like two parallel train tracks. She does her women's ministry. He does her men's ministry. They never realize that her most important ministry in the world's him. His most important ministry in the world's her. God's brought them together as a unified team to pass faith through the generations of their family. Now, ladies, you might look at your things on your job description, help, respect, submit, and you may say, there's that 100-foot high jump bar again. And you know what the temptation is? Oh, that's really not what God meant. That's an old-fashioned, 2,000-year-old stuff. Or you look at that stuff, help submit respect, and you say, God, I don't have it in me. I don't have the virtue or the character to be a wife like that. But I know someone who can get over that bar. That's my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit today, you've got to enable me to be the wife I'll never be left to myself. I'd like to ask you to bow your heads and to close your eyes, and I want to guide you through a series of prayer responses here. Some of you are here, um, you're a married person, and you're sitting right next to your spouse right now. I want to give an encouragement to husbands to just whisper a one-sentence prayer if it's the desire of your heart. Don't feel compelled to do it. It's only, you should only pray if you want to. But husbands, if it's the desire of your heart, whisper this prayer. God, turn my heart to my wife. Whisper that so she could hear it. God, turn my heart to my wife. And then wives, some of you are here and your husband's sitting right next to you. And maybe God has convicted you to pray that same prayer right now. God, turn my heart to my husband. Whisper that so he could hear Some of us need right now to to pray urgently for a marriage in crisis. Maybe that marriage is filled with abuse, abandonment, or or addiction. 
or adultery and you need an urgent miracle from God, please don't, don't leave the church today without coming and talking to me or going to that prayer room and bringing what's dark out into the light. Maybe you're here and you're, you're needing healing from a broken marriage. Just ask God to heal your heart now. Maybe you're here and you'd like to be married someday. Ask the Lord to begin preparing your heart now to be a godly husband, to be a godly wife. If the Lord would bless you with children, a godly father and a godly mother. Lord, all around the room, people have lifted up prayers, urgent prayers, Lord, for, for heart change. Husbands asking for their hearts to be turned to their wives. Wives, their hearts turned to their husband. Prayers for, for healing after broken families and broken relationships or prayers for miracles in, in marriages that are hanging on just by, by a thread. Thank you that you hear all those prayers. Thank you that Jesus Christ truly did die on the cross for every sin and that he rose again from the dead, giving us supernatural forgiveness and supernatural strength to be the kind of people you've called us to be. And we just thank you for this time this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.